simple version of the story that many people are familiar with. But we are, there are details in the Qur'an that are very important that are missing when you think of the story in this way. Allah Azza wa Jal first announces to, the, to all of the angels and we understand that it includes at that time Iblis among them in this announcement Inni khaliqun basharan min teen. I am about to create a human being from dirt or from clay. So Allah has, when He's saying this, He has not made Adam yet. Adam السلام, has not been created yet, but the announcement has been made that Allah is about to do it. This is Khaliqun Basharan Mintin. And then Fa'idha, the, the word Ida in Arabic is used for describing something that is going to happen in the future. Fa'idha sawaituhu wa nafaqtu fihi min ruhi. And when I'm done balancing him, and when I blow into him from my ruh, so it's none of this has happened yet, it's going to happen. Then he says, Faqa'u lahu sa then fall into sajda before. Now there's a, there's a discussion about Lam that I had with a, a notable scholar many years ago and I was surprised that a few months ago he agreed with what I, what I said about this. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but I want you to focus first on the first piece of this conversation. Allah has described that He is about to create our Father and He has also described the process He's going to use to create us. He says, first of all, I'm going to make Him from teen. Now let's pause here for a second. We're not the only creation on this earth made from teen. In fact, all of the animals and all of the species that exist on this planet also are made from teen. So that's the common element between us and the rest of the life that exists on this planet. All of the animals and all of the insects, all of it, that's, that's from teen, fine. But there's something additional about this creation that he's about to make, our father and by extension us, that is more than just teen. There's something more than just this animal presence, this animal existence. And by the way, we have something in common with animals. Animals seek food and shelter. We go to the grocery store seeking food. We go to the restaurant seeking food. We look for shelter too. In fact, those are the two primary things that drive us to get an education and get a job or start a business. At the end of the day, it boils down to food and shelter. What's in the fridge? and whether or not you're living in a home that, that has proper shelter. Are the electricity bills paid? Is the water running? What I'm trying to say is, we're just way more advanced at getting food and shelter than animals, but at the end of the day, those are the same basic functions. And then they procreate. They have children. They continue the species, and that's what human beings do too. So in that sense, as far as the continuity of life, we're not that much different from the animal kingdom and from what any other species does. We build homes, a bird builds a nest. We go out and you know, seek our rizq, and the birds go out and they seek their rizq. But then Allah adds, He's informing the angels, why is this creation from dirt different from all the other species that exist? فَإِذَا سَوَيْتُهُ when I, when I make him balanced, when I make him balanced, taswiya is actually to perfect and balance the craft of something. So for example, if somebody's designing uh, you know, or, or welding metal, they kind of make sure that the metal is welded completely even and they have tools to make sure that it's completely straight. That's called taswiya. So Allah says that there's a level of balance and perfection that is going to be added to this creature that doesn't exist in other creatures. But in, a, in, in one sense, other species physically have way more balance than we do. Monkeys can hang on one arm. They have pretty good balance. Birds have amazing reflexes, right? So this is talking more than just our ability to stand up on two feet. Allah is telling us that human beings will have an ability to balance opposing things. They're going to have the ability, for example, to balance their individual needs with the needs of their family. They're going to balance their personal responsibilities with social responsibilities. They're going to balance their, their rights and their responsibilities. They're going to balance, the, our entire life is actually going to amount to balance. And in fact, today, now, there are, you know, there's a multi-million dollar industry that, you know, teaches, multi, you know, successful people, business people, executives, they attend these work-life balance seminars, right, to achieve balance. And Allah says that human beings have the potential, this human being will have the potential to live a life that is evened out, that's balanced. That's one of the great qualities of the human being that Allah describes that's going to make him amazing. So first he's made like 
every other animal, but then he's got this remarkable ability to balance things. And then he says, on top of all of that, وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ By the way, one aspect of balance before I go further is he says, I, you know, uh, the balance is actually between our impulses, our emotions, and our thought process. So let me explain what that means. When, an, when, a, when a hungry dog sees something, it goes and it bites it. It doesn't think about the consequences. There's the emotion and then there's the action, that's it. But human beings, they can look at something and say, no, that's illegal. No, that's haram. No, that, uh, the, their mind comes in at work, they think about the consequences. You're getting late for work, there's a red light, right? You, ha you have the ability to balance your emotion, your need, your, your desire to get to work early, but your need to abide by the law and stop at the red light. We're able to balance our thoughts and our emotions. Unlike other species, when they have an emotion, they have an impulse, they jump on it. They react. But we can think about the consequences. We can think about the long term. We can hold ourselves back. It, that's actually one of the great names of our intellect in the Quran is Al-Hijr and An-Nuha. These are words that are used to describe our intellect. And Al-Hijr means a boulder, a rock. Because a rock is a barrier to moving forward. And An-Nuha is prevention. Because our, our mind prevents us from doing stupid things. It's, it gets in our way and sometimes, you know, you get, I get overwhelmed with emotions and we make stupid decisions. Or we say things we shouldn't have said. Or we do things we shouldn't have done because we weren't thinking at the time. Because we let our emotions get out of balance, right? So Allah Azza wa here says, human beings will be made with this amazing ability of balance. Then he says, وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ And then on top of that, I will blow into him from my own ruh, meaning the ruh that Allah, Allah especially designed for this human being, this special spiritual connection, this special thing that will connect him, this human being, and Allah together in a unique way. In this unique, powerful way. That's what's going to be inside him. So this ruh is inside him unlike other animals and other species. There's a special kind of thing, a special kind of light inside this human being. So he's made up of these three things. He's made up of dirt, and he's made up of this balance, and he's made up of this ruh. Three components Allah described in this ayah, and he let the angels know, these are the three parts that will make this human being amazing. And when these three things come together, then فَقَعُولَهُ سَاجِدِينَ Then fall into sajda. So when you study sajda in the Qur'an, you learn something. If you just scan the entire Qur'an and look at where Allah talks about sajda. Allah talks about sajda when something incredible happens. Allah talks about sajda when a miracle happens. When the, when the sorcerers, the magicians, saw the staff of Musa turn into a snake, a giant snake, and eat whatever fikun, whatever they had made up, they couldn't help themselves. They fell into sajda. When Christian people came to visit Rasulullah wasallam, and they heard the Qur'an, tara a'yunahum tafidu min ad-dam'i, you're gonna see their eyes start rolling with tears, yakhiruna lil adqani sujjadan, they fall on their faces in sajda, because they're so overwhelmed by the miracle of the Qur'an. There's even an incident in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, where when the ayah, the kuffar were listening, the kuffar, they don't even believe in the Qur'an, they were listening. فَأَنذَرْتُكُمْ صَاعِقَةً مِثْلَ صَاعِقَةِ عَادٍ وَثَمُودٍ When the ayah came, I warn you of a thunderbolt, like the one that came to Adin Thamud, they fell into sajda. They couldn't even help themselves. They fell into sajda. The Qur'an is describing over and over again, when something overwhelming happens, something incredible happens that Allah does, that only Allah could do, that a human being feels so powerful, it's like their knees buckle, and their pride disappears, and this, this, this thing that carries our pride falls on the face. In every culture, historically, this is the place of pride. This is why the king wears the crown here, not on the wrist. Nowadays, the status symbol is an expensive watch, or so that's on the wrist, right? But historically, what, what is the show of pride in every culture is what goes on the head, right? The turban goes on the head, the crown goes on the head, you know? This is the show of where you stand. There are countries in the world today where they have certain kinds of headgear, only the locals can wear that. If you wear that, you get in trouble. You can wear a different color, you can't wear, that's their color. That's the elite class, <laughs> you know? This is our pride. This is our sense of position in society. And you know what? All of that disappears when you recognize the power of Allah, you're overwhelmed by that, you just fall into sajda. That's what the Qur'an describes over and over again. And Allah is making a claim here to all of the angels. And the angels, it's important to note, the angels don't just see the seen. The angels are creatures of the unseen. So what, what is invisible to us, like the arsh of Allah, 
what is invisible to us like the jinn, what is invisible to us like the secrets of the skies. Many of them, the angels, they've, they've, they travel through the skies. So we can be amazed by a mountain or an ocean or a waterfall, the seen world, that amazes us. When somebody studies the universe and, and looks through an electron microscope, they can be amazed by the vastness of the seen universe. Can you imagine, add to the seen universe those that have seen the unseen also. How much more amazed by what Allah does are they? And then on top of that, they get to communicate directly with Allah. Allah talks directly to the angels. They're not like us. They have direct back and forth communication with Allah. And Allah is telling them that this creature is so incredible. Of all the vast universe that He created, of all the things that He put in this remarkable seen and unseen kaun, He says this one thing is so powerful that every last one of you should be overwhelmed at what Allah has done when He created Adam. That you should fall into sajda. You should just be you know, like in awe of this incredible miracle of Allah that deserves that all of the angels of Allah فَسَجَدَ الْمَلَائِكَةَ كُلُّهُمْ أَجْمَعُونَ All of them, all together, fall, fell into sajda. The thing is when, when the, the staff of Musa salam incident happened, a few magicians fell into sajda. When a few people heard the Qur'an, a few, you know, the disbelievers fell into sajda, or some Christians fell into sajda. You find some fall into sajda. And you find in this one incident, Every angel that Allah ever created is commanded to fall into sajda. How big of a miracle, how big of a deal is the creation of Adam alayhi salam? How powerful is this creation? When you, st when you contemplate that, and, you, and again, Adam has not been created yet. This is just the announcement. Why should you? Why should you be so amazed? What deserves this sajda? What warrants it? Why should they fall on their faces? Well, it's because of these three things. Then, therefore, or thereafter, fall into sajda. The fa could be sababiya too. Thus, you will fall into sajda before him. So now, this announcement is made. And Iblis, we know, heard this announcement also. And if Iblis heard this announcement, he also knows that Adam is made up of three things. I keep saying three things so it sticks in your head. Three things, three things, three things. But we know that when Allah tells us that when He refused to do sajda, He turns to Allah. He doesn't say, خَلَقْتَنِي مِن نَارٍ وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِن طِينٍ وَسَوَّيْتَهُ وَنَفَخْتَ فِيهِ مِن رُوحِكَ He doesn't say that. He says, you made me from fire, you made him from dirt. That's just one of those three things, isn't it? There's two more things. And he knows about those two other things. He knows about the taswiyah, the balance of the human being. He also knows about the ruh that is inside the human being. But when he complains to Allah that you made him from dirt, he pretends that he doesn't know about those other two things. But he does. He fully knows. The, the, this is a really important thing that I want to highlight in these brief moments in this khutbah. There's hundreds of lessons in the story of Adam alayhi salam, but I hope I can do some justice to this one lesson that I want you to take today. And that is that when he denies these other two things, he knows, he knows that if he acknowledges those two things, then he has to acknowledge how incredible the human being actually is. But if he only acknowledges the dirt, if he only acknowledges the mud, then what's the difference between Adam and a horse? What's the difference between Adam and a cow and a monkey? They eat, he eats, they get shelter, they get shelter. They have kids, he has kids. He's, not, he's just an evolved animal, that's all. Okay, so he can stand on his two feet, big deal. What's the big deal? He's just an evolved species, there's nothing more to him. There's nothing more to him. So he has a certain, he deliberately denies two components of our existence out of the three. Two of them, he denies them, and if he accepts them, then he has to accept the supremacy of what Allah has made, the remarkable thing Allah has made. Now, he hates humanity. He blames Allah for giving us this position. For, for, and he swore that he wants to not only see Adam alayhi salam fail, because you know, if you hate Adam, then you got Adam expelled from Jannah, you should be like, I'm good now, I got my revenge, feel better. Nah, he doesn't feel better. He's like, now I'm gonna get his kids, and now I'm gonna get his family, and now I'm gonna get their kids, and their kids. And he 
keeps ruining human beings time and time and time and time again, and the rage of his fury doesn't go away. He doesn't feel any better after getting revenge or destroying. He doesn't feel any better. So the, the, the thing is, how does he destroy human beings? He does many things to destroy us, but one of the most important things he does, which is actually, now I get to talk about the topic of my khutbah today. One of the things that we learn from this passage and these ayat of the Qur'an is that Iblis did not want the human being to be acknowledged as something worthy. And his greatest success, one of his greatest successes, if he can convince you and me that in fact you're not worthy. Self-worth, valuing yourself, respecting yourself as a human being is actually one of the great crises in the world today. People in the sociology, world of sociology, people in the world of psychology, people across in families across the world are, are facing a crisis of people who don't see any worth in themselves. Oh, I used to have a job, but I'm retired now. Nobody cares about my opinion. I, you know, I'm worthless. I just sit home all day. My son has a job. My, my, you know, you know, my daughters are gone away to college, and I'm just useless here. I'm just a burden on everyone. There's an old man sitting in his home thinking he's completely worthless. All I can do is just go to the masjid and come back, but I live with this worthlessness inside me. It's just better if I just die. These are the thoughts he had inside his, has inside his, he doesn't say it. Sometimes he even says it. Sometimes he even says it. Lives, in, lives with this worthlessness. A young man lives with worthlessness. He says, my brother graduated, my, my cousin got a job, everybody else is doing better, this one already got married, look, look at me, I, I've got nothing. I didn't accomplish any of those things. Oh, I wasted so many years. I should have done this, I should have done that. I, uh, everybody tells me I'm a loser, I must be a loser. What does Iblis want to do? He wants to get people to say things around you in your life. They'll say things to you that make you feel worthless. They don't even realize they're doing it. They don't even realize it. But they're having this effect on you when you start thinking, yeah, maybe I am worthless. Maybe I, you know, I'm, I'm, not, that, I'm not that big of a deal. I'm, I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. And you know what that does? Once you develop low self-esteem, you don't value yourself, then you're always thinking, the only way I will be valued is if somebody else values me. If somebody else approves then I have value. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take a picture of myself, I'm gonna make sure I change all the filters enough times, and then I'm gonna post it online, and I'm gonna wait for somebody to do this, or somebody to put, a, put one of these, or at least a mashallah or something. Give me something, because if somebody gives me, I have some value. All right, now what do I gotta do? I, I need more value, because I'm worthless again. I haven't posted in two days. I need to get back on. I need to feel valued again. When you don't have enough value for yourself, you're always looking for value from where? Somewhere else. Someone else. Always looking for somebody else's approval. Always looking for somebody else's compliment. You didn't say anything. You didn't do, what do you think? What do you think, of, what do you think I should do? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? Constantly asking for somebody else's opinion. Because without it, you're worthless. And then you become afraid. You, you, you know, when you become... Uh, when you have low self-esteem, then you, you can't deal with any of your rights. Like people can walk all over you, they can humiliate you, and in your head you're like, yeah, I deserve it, I'm scum anyway. I mean, this is, I should be, I, sh I deserve even, even worse. And then what's, be what's even better is Iblis comes to those in your life sometimes, and he says, hey, say this to him. Say, you know what, I know I treat you like a dog, but you deserve worse than that. So you should be happy that I even treat you this much. Okay, you're lucky to even get this much treatment. And you hear that enough times and what happens? You start internalizing it. Because human beings, even if you reject something at first, if you hear it enough times, you start getting influenced by that. You start seeing yourself that way. You start developing a hatred not just for others but also for yourself. And then you just, this rage inside you is always like, my opinion doesn't matter. Everybody else's opinion matters. My voice is no good. Everybody else's voice is better. My presence is a burden. I have nothing to offer anyone. When you start developing this, this is a great victory of shaitan because shaitan says, that's what I was saying, man. That's exactly what I was saying. It's just dirt. Look at him. What balance? What rule? What and what does Allah do? Before you and I even came on this earth, 
because of what our father was given, which we have been given, the creation of our bodies, then on top of that the taswiyah, and on top of that the ruh. He gave us an honor above all of Allah's creation, and all of us, Allah's creation see us as a miracle of Allah, worthy of all the angels falling into sajda, in awe of what Allah has done, in amazement at what Allah has done. So now the angels in the heavens are impressed with you, and you're not impressed with yourself. You think you're worthless. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We honored the sons, the children of Adam. We honored the children of Adam. You know what this ayah teaches me? It teaches me I don't have to look for validation from anybody else. I can look for what, did I do a good job or not? I should check. Did the food come out? You, you, you know, uh, you, you shouldn't like take this lesson and say, you know what, I don't need anybody else's opinion. Now, I'm gonna go home and pour all the salt into the food and then cook it and say, how does it taste? Well, I don't care about your opinion because Allah has honored me. Like, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying at all. We do need to get correction from each other. And by the way, when you, are, when you value yourself, then being criticized is not humiliation. When you truly honor yourself, when you truly realize your worth, worthiness, then you realize that when someone, if someone is criticizing and saying, hey, you said this incorrectly, or you need to improve this, or this could be better, then they're doing me a favor to help me improve. I don't feel like I'm being insulted. Because when you have really low self-worth, then criticism feels like you're being pushed even lower down. But that feeling goes away once you have value for yourself. Once you recognize Allah has given me value. Then you start seeing correction or criticism as an opportunity. As an opportunity to grow. It's not humiliating anymore. But this is one side of the equation. That we value ourselves. But Iblis, you know, he's got multiple tactics. And with, I talked about balance in the beginning. One of the things Allah gave us is balance. Nowadays, a lot of, because you know, people are not, no longer, the majority of the world is no longer interested in educating itself through books or reading or long study. In fact, if a video is more than 30 seconds, move on, move on. And then they say, you know what they call that? I've been doing a lot of research. No, you haven't. You've been swiping TikTok. You, that's not called research. You know, but we, oh, I've been doing a lot of research into psychology. No, no, you haven't. A three minute YouTube video was not research into psychology. You're, you, you haven't studied anything. Right, but we, we've become accustomed to quick sound bites, you know, quick, quick kinds of education. And as a result of that, we, we want quick validation. And one of the things that's happened in a lot of this social media environment is one subject that keeps coming up is self-love, self-worth, self-esteem, which is what I'm talking about too. But you can take that too far. You're, you're amazing. You're the best. Believe in yourself. You, you, you. Nafsuk, nafsuk, nafsuk. And you're like, yes, nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. You know, and uh, you, you become like obsessed with, yeah, I'm awesome. I'm amazing. And then some parents do this to their kids. You're the best. You're the best ever. You're the princess. The little four-year-old girl. You're my princess. Everybody else is ugly. You're the prettiest. You're the best. And this little girl turns into a monster. She goes at school and she goes, the princess is here. Kiss the ring. Like she, she develops this like inflated sense of self. Our worthiness, our worthiness before Allah is something that should make us humble. Allah, give me such a high position. I better put that to work. I better put that to work. I want to give you this by analogy. Imagine somebody gave you, you, you know, you didn't believe in yourself. You don't think you're that good, but you applied for a job anyway, right? You applied, they're like, I'm pretty sure they're not gonna hire me. You get a call back and they wanna give you the executive position, way higher. And you know, you, from what you know of yourself, you're like, I'm so not qualified for this. But you get put in that position anyway. Now once you get put in that position, I want you to think about, and I want myself to think about, what am I, what's going on in my head inside? Am I thinking, yep, the boss is here. Watch out, that's my chair. Or are you thinking, I have been given such a high position, I better live up to this. I better up my game. I better learn more. I better become more adaptive. I better, you know, honor this role that I've been given so I can actually prove my worthiness. So the, the honor was given to you first, even before you got a chance to prove yourself. 
the healthy attitude would be, I need to live up to this. Like it or not, now I'm here, I better step up. You understand? On the, on the flip side is someone who gets that position without having earned it, and then says, you know what, What's, what else is there to do? I already got this position, you know? Now I can look down at everybody else who doesn't have this position. Fake it till you make it, right? That's not, that's not how this works. This is actually the, the, the reality of arrogance. So on the one hand, we value ourselves. But what we actually are supposed to value is the potential that Allah gave us. We're supposed to value the ability to make the effort that Allah gave us. Not the things that Allah gave us. The things that Allah gave us, He can give to anybody else. And these things will come and they will go. But the only thing of value before Allah is, and before, before ourselves should actually be just our efforts. وَأَلَّيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى Human beings will have nothing of worth on Judgment Day except the efforts that they made. That's it. That's all that's going to matter. So what's the, this, this balance between confidence and humility that has to be struck? Because too much self-worth will turn into arrogance. And too much humility, then you start thinking, I'm nothing, I'm nobody. I'll give you an example of this that I saw in the Islamic space. I was at a university many years ago. There were almost no Muslims in the university. Five or six young men that are Muslim students in the university, right? And there's no masjid for like a hundred miles. So they've got to make Jumu'ah by themselves, these five young guys, right? And one of them is a Hafiz Qur'an. So obviously it falls on him to kind of prepare something, learn a little bit, to be able to give the khutbah and to lead the prayer. And he won't do it. He won't do it. And then you go to him and say, hey, why, why won't you give the khutbah? Akhi, I am nothing. I'm just a faqir. I, I'm, I, know, I know I'm my worthlessness before Allah. How can I stand on the member of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Because I know that I'm not even worth the dirt of the feet of the ulama that are here. And he starts giving you this whole humility talk about how, no, 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 I'm nothing, I'm worthless, I'm useless. And I tell him, I know you're useless, but still, the thing is, if you don't do it, this guy is going to lead the prayer in English. He's going to say, oh, God is great. And then he's going <laughs> to, that's what he's going to, so you know what, you kind of have to step up, bro. You got to step up. You've been put in a certain position. You, this is not about arrogance. You're confusing the need for confidence with arrogance. This is a time to show confidence. But too much confidence, now if you imagine he starts giving the khutbah, but then there's somebody else that comes along and says, hey, this week we have a scholar. Oh, why is he taking my spot? I like my spot. Why, why, why you got to take my spot for? Can't you give him like Saturday khutbah or something? I don't know, is there an alternative? Because I'm kind of used to having the, the main stage, right? So that, now there's arrogance. So there's this balance between confidence and humility that has to be struck. And that's what Allah Azza wa Jal defined as one of the most amazing qualities that human beings have. That Allah gave inside of us. This, there's this spiritual and there's this material. There's this confidence and there's this humility. And they both coexist. There's taswiyah all the time. And it's remarkable, right? That on the one hand Allah mentioned dirt. And on the other hand Allah mentioned the ruh. The two opposites. And in between them He mentioned balance. فَإِذَا سَوَيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِمَ الرُّوحِ SubhanAllah like the, the, our entire life is supposed to be a struggle to find that balance. To find that, that real worth in ourselves. So we're not looking for it in other people. We're not looking for it in things. We're not looking for it in posts or engagement or followers. We're not looking for, for worth in the clothes we're wearing. We're looking for worth in what we, what we, what we give to Allah Azza wa And if, if you're an old gentleman or you're retired and you, have, you feel like you have nothing to offer the world, stop thinking this way. Every one of us will be a learner until the day we die. There's no age where you should stop learning. And the, moment, the more you're learning, the more you're enriching yourself. And the more you enrich yourself, naturally the world around you gets enriched. There's more wisdom you can offer. There's more you can give. Somebody, and this is the last thing I'll share with you, a gentleman who passed away recently that I knew about, an, an elderly gentleman who uh, had retired many years ago and he was just living at home and he spent his entire day just studying and learning and studying and learning. And when he passed away, his children, because he hadn't had a job. So if you look at it from a material point of view, he was kind of a financial burden on the family, trips to the hospital all the time. You know, and you know, what are we going to do with him? Who's going to take care of him? You know, 
But on the other hand, when he left, you know all those kids and their grand, his grandkids and all of them, you know what they remember? The things he used to read and he used to share. The wisdom that he used to share. And that those little bits of wisdom, you don't know, they might change that grandson's life. There may be a time where, you know, just like Allah describes Yusuf alayhi لَوْلَا أَرْرَعَ بُرْحَانَ رَبِّهِ Yusuf alayhi salam heard some bits of good counsel from his father Yaqub when he was little and so many years of his life he held on to Islam. The only tarbiyah he had were some words of wisdom he heard from his father years ago, right? So no, no goodness is worthless. No good effort is worthless. No human being is worthless. Find value in yourself that Allah has already given you. May Allah Azza wa Jal allow us to value ourselves, see our worth, and not allow shaitan to make me and you see ourselves as someone worthless or unworthy or someone who should be stepped on or should be punished. We should stop doing that self-hatred and may Allah allow that self-value never to turn into arrogance. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim.